So community-based contribution is the strongest pillar for the cybersecurity ecosystem. And if we don't care more about it, we may tear it down. So hello, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, attending so early in the morning. Um, my name is Markus Ludwig. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Tecura, a German startup. I was working for IBM in the past 16 years uh, for IBM security division as part of the X-Force Threat Intel team uh, in multiple roles like privacy, DevOps, compliance, security, everything that nobody wanted to do. And um, yeah, within, maybe you know X-Force Exchange, the threat intelligence sharing portal, a few of us, I guess, right? So that has been developed by that team and operated by that team. Uh, within Tecura, we are doing um, actually cyber threat intelligence services, um, more uh, focused on tuning security operations with dynamic CTI and reducing false positives, things like that. But today I don't want to talk about Tecura or CTI itself. It's uh, more about the values and problems around community-based contribution and maybe some ways or thoughts uh, how, to, how to make things better. It's a rather non-technical talk, so sorry for the tech guys here. Uh, it's more about the well-known values that uh, are worth to be bespoken much more often than they are today. Um, and yeah, I'm a fan of storytelling, so uh, I try to be, to be some entertaining here with a small story. And I hope you enjoy it. First, I want to start with introducing Carl. Carl is a SOC analyst. He's 34 years old, and as you may have guessed, he feels a little bit older than he actually is. That might be related to too many coffee or too many night shifts. Might be related to too many kids in combination with night shifts. But actually, if we look at the um, daily work routine, that uh, Carl has, we see some influence. For example, 25% of his time, he has to chase down or hunt for false al alerts. That's, by the way, a number of the Ponemon Institute. 25%, that means more than 12,000 hours within 30 years. If you only take a lower hourly rate of, let's say, 60 euros per hour, then you end up with more than 720,000 euros. That's quite a lot, right, for actually wasted time. On the other hand, Carl and his team are not able to handle all alerts that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, on average, only 4% of security-relevant events are considered in an average enterprise. Events, not alerts, okay? Um, that's, that's not much. So no wonder that 80% of cybersecurity professionals state they feel some level of burnout. People like Carl, right? Companies um, like the one Carl is working for know that. They try to reduce the workload using better solutions, for example. They try to increase... There are teams, they try to hire people, but guess what? There are none. There are, the experts are not laying around and are waiting for the company of Carl or any other company uh, to be hired. There is a worldwide gap of cybersecurity professionals of 2.7 million. That's also a big number, right? Um, so are you currently looking for new hires? Maybe you can raise your hand if you are currently looking for new hires. Quite a lot, right? And how, how many of you are doing that since a while? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the bespoken uh, shortage of, of skilled workers. It's real. It's a threat itself to companies if you don't have the right people. So let's look at someone else. Um, Kimi, 21. Very smart. She's a student uh, studying math. Um, she loves to solve riddles. 
and she's doing some nerdy stuff in her spare time, uh, malware behavior analytics, running her own traps or uh, her uh, sandbox environments. And whenever she gains some insights, she writes something on her weblog, she's putting out a tweet on Twitter, things like that, sharing. That's the motto, sharing is caring. Uh, and I know a lot of you are doing the same here. Uh, maybe not in your spare time, but maybe also in your spare time. Um, so that's important. That's an important part, and I will show you why. Let's go back to Carl. Carl is working on an alert, came in in the SOC, maybe based on EDR. Um, he's now looking into a communication of a workstation with an unknown URL, and he is trying to find out what that URL is about. Is it benign? Is it not benign? Whatever. And um, even if his company pays a lot for threat intelligence, he can't find out what it is about. So he's doing a web research. He's investigating more, and what happens is he stumbles over the web log of Kimmy. And Kimmy wrote about a malware downloader that is communicating exactly with that URL. So Carl is opening a case, CSERT is doing more research, more investigation, uh, they identify something is going on in the network. All good, it's not about the, the hack or a breach or whatever, it's about the incredible value of Kimmy's information on the web blog. Because that one may have saved the company of Carl several million dollars. Just as easy like that. So there are quite some limitations when consuming information like the one from Kimmy's web blog. For, for example, format which form it does an information has. Is it structured data, unstructured data? Is it a JSON file you find somewhere or a CSV file? How do you consume that information? If possible, you try to do that automatically, right? Um, the other one is what is the channel, the channel Kimmy is using or others are using to contribute intelligence information. Is it a weblog? Is it a GitHub project? Is it a MISP community? Is it a closed community or an open community? With whom to, do you share? So as you can see, it's a problem, and you have to be lucky to have, have the right information at the right time in the right format so it helps you. Another one is a lack of validation. So is that information somehow validated? Do you, are you able to validate it somehow? Okay, uh, so um, I'm not sure. I guess a lot of you are using open source information uh, in your day-to-day -day work. Um, can you raise your hand if you are doing so? I guess <laughs> nearly all, yeah. And are you actually trusting those information to automatically action on that? None, right? at least not a lot. Yeah, that's, that's missing trust. And a higher rate of false positives um, might also be a reason, right? On the other hand, there is not only a limitation when consuming information, there is also some burden to the person who is contributing. The first of all is pretty obvious, spending time. If you do that in your spare time, you have to spend time, even if you are doing it as part of the job, but not as your main job role, uh, you, are, you have to spend time for that. And uh, that means you have to operate the environment, you have to do the investigation, you have to write the blog. And um, maybe if you look at Kimmy, she also has to explain her dad the third time how the new smartphone works, so time is a critical resource. Uh, not only for Kimi, so uh, rather for all people in the communities. The second one is money. If you do that in your spare time, it's very likely that you spend all the expenses out of your own pocket. Your equipment, the domain, internet access, your, uh, maybe you have some cloud services you have to pay, or energy, right? And if you have some bills, you may have 
to have a part-time job if, if you're like Kimmy, a student, and that also means less time. Less time means I don't have time to validate information, do quality assurance, ending up again in a problem missing trust, right? Um, also, two to three times a week, Kimmy has to ban some trolls. They are commenting, they like, uh, like to, to offend people. So finger pointing is also a problem. And all these reasons lead to stopping contribution. People stop contributing because they don't have the time, they don't have the money, or they don't like to be in the finger pointing area. So I was on an expo uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, someone from Microsoft was talking about the threat analysts they have. They stated they have more than 8,500 threat analysts worldwide, which is a quite big number, right? Um, someone else, I think he was from Trend Micro, stated they have 1,000 threat analysts, also a big number. But if you compare that to all the enthusiasts out there, the millions of people, hobbyists, security researcher, people who are sharing information without the commercial intent, that's quite a small number. If we now look at the gap of professionals out there, it's crucial that we don't lose the information, the knowledge, the expertise of contribution of communities who are bringing their research, their intelligence to all of us. That's really crucial, especially if you look that the attack landscape is growing daily based on digitalization. Everything is getting smarter and so on and so on. You know all of that, right? So. Question is, what can we do, we all of us, what can we do to keep people like Kimmy contributing? Any ideas? Any suggestions? No? Yeah, very good. Yeah, rewards, incentives. I put a few here. The first of all is as easy as say thanks. Say thanks to your Kimmies. Say thanks means it's a normal thing. If you get a gift, say thanks. Unfortunately, that's not so often happening when you look at contribution in the CTI area or in the cybersecurity area. Um, and everybody wants to hear a thanks. The other one is name them, like them, share them, reshare them. Retweet them, so reshare them only if allowed, of course, right? Uh, the, then contribution is a thing, and participation. If you participate in a community, if you ask, can I help you, um, is there anything, we just heard it here, uh, that, that this is critical, we need the people in the communities to participate, and even if you only provide feedback, it's already something that helps increasing quality, for example. Keeps people motivated. And last but not least, buy Kimmy a coffee, if you can. And especially if you are using community-based information in your commercial environment, you may think about donating, spending some money. So all of that does help to build more trust, to increase the quality, and keep people motivated, staying motivated to contribute. And that helps us all. Just a few examples, right? Where uh, contribution led to saving other people's money, time, um, whatever, uh, I mean, the one, uh, the kill switch of WannaCry is well known to everybody. Just a few examples. Uh, and we may have to think from time to time, who has helped me today in my job and may have done that without sending an invoice. 
small takeaways. Uh, the takeaways uh, from from this story: the cybersecurity world profits from all the private people out there, also from those who are taking some time during their work time to contribute. This is also important. Um, and there are much more non-paid private researchers than paid professionals out there. And most of them do not gain the appreciation they deserve. So we should change that. That's the message I want to send over using a small story today. And that's all. That's my little small story. Any questions? Hello. Hey. Uh, that was really respectful. Uh, and also I want to ask an extra applause for the community worldwide. I'm an incident responder and I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. I'm not alone in this. So it's for the community. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I wanted to mention one thing that I saw in your slides about credits. Uh, this, for what we have seen in the past year with the MIS community, if you give credits to people, they tend to contribute more. Exactly. And that's super important. Indeed, you, you were mentioning that, and I think it's, it's a recurring point. Uh, if you acknowledge the work of others and so on, and I think it's going direction, but he was mentioning about uh, standing off the shoulder of giants, it's super important. And when you do that, you see that communities are growing, and that's quite important. Yep. Can't agree more. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, from feedback from maintaining an OSINT feed. So one of the things that help for finger pointing is providing a contact page where people can contact you if you made an error. And once you they claim that you made an error, you give an explanation why you did a certain investigation, why something is strongly published. So that helps for the finger pointing. And for donation, but I can speak from first hand. So I make a free feed in my spare time. And I've seen that pop up on commercial feeds as part of commercial offering without any attribution. And that's, yeah, that's really killing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that needs to be changed, right? That should be changed. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments or idea? Anyway, thank you very much. Just one more thing. Uh, of course, the thank you also goes to the contributors of my presentation, those who shared uh, free pictures, those who shared their information sources. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>